Okay, well, thank you, Anton. And uh, it's, it's actually really a pleasure to be able to do this. Um, you guys are the right audience um, for this talk. And so, uh, so I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you about this and to hear your feedback. And, uh, you know, um, I think it'll be, it'll be fun. So, so this is my, uh, my sort of uh, pandemic project, if you will. Um, and uh, so this is a fairly recent uh, work that I've um, uh, uh, been doing, which um, sort of takes off on an old problem, um, uh, which is basically the Landauer formula. And I've come up with a kind of generalization um, of that uh, to higher dimensions. And so um, I'll start off with some introduction about you know, just sort of basic uh, quantized uh, response. Um, and then uh, describe um, this generalization um, that I've come up with, which um, probes a topological property of a metal, um, which is uh, the Euler characteristic of the Fermi C. And I'll explain to you what this Euler characteristic um, is. And you know, the, the, the main thing that I want to get across in this talk is um, a thought experiment, um, which sort of captures the essence of, of, of what I have in mind. And then um, one can back up that thought experiment with some more um, concrete calculations um, with various levels of, um, of you know, sophistication, basically a Boltzmann theory, um, and then you know, doing sort of a nonlinear uh, response theory as well. Um, so, um, you know, so there's a question of whether this is actually something which can, can conceivably be measured in an experiment. Um, and so this is something I think that's worth thinking about. Um, uh, there are caveats and issues associated with that, um, which I will um, try to describe to you. Um, so I'll, I'll describe a kind of setup that one conceivably could, could um, think of um, involving what I'll call a triple point contact. Um, uh, but there are, um, there are issues that, um, that, that need to be addressed um, associated with that. Um, and, you know, um, I think this idea <clears throat> may point to some some further things that are worth thinking about. And um, so I'm hope, hoping that this, you know, could be the beginning of a, of a direction that will be interesting to, uh, to pursue. So I'll, I'll describe some of those, those directions uh, at the end. Okay, so let me just start off with some very just basic, um, so, that, so for many in the audience, this is of course a, a review, but, um, but just, uh, you know, you know um, in condensed matter physics, one of the themes that we have um, had over the last several decades has been the phen phenomenon of quantized response. Okay, and um, and so this is epitomized <clears throat> by the uh, by the quantized Hall effect, where in a two-dimensional electron gas is in a in a magnetic field, um, one observes that there are steps in the Hall resistance that occur at very precisely quantized integer units of h over e squared. Okay, and, um, and so, uh, so this is a remarkable phenomenon, which was really discovered experimentally. And, and the remarkable thing is that this integer is so accurately quantized. Okay, one can measure it to one part in 10 to the ninth. And in fact, now this is the definition of the kilogram is, is based on this, on this, on this kind of um, uh, experiment. And, and so, the, so, so that posed the question of how, why could this be so precise? And that was um, a fact that initiated um, you know, uh, 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 you know, geniuses in theoretical physics to think very deeply about this and come up with the idea that topology is playing a fundamental role in um, in uh, in these quantum systems. Okay, and so what has emerged from that is um, so one strand that has emerged from that is this idea of topological band theory. You know, so one can understand the. Um, the electronic states in, in at least not in, in weakly correlated systems by thinking about single particle uh, electronic states. And what the Hall, the integer quantized Hall conductance is probing is it is probing a topological property of the, of the valence band, the sort of manifold of occupied states um, in, a, uh, in, in, a, in an electrical system that has an energy gap. Okay, and so what the integer quantized Hall uh, conductance probes is the is the churn number, which basically tells you how these block wave functions are twisting as a function of momentum as you go around the Brillouin zone. Okay, now um, 
so one of the themes that's emerged over the last you know, 20 years is that there are many, many more versions of this type of phenomena that can happen. And particularly when there are symmetries, then one gets a much richer uh, kind of uh, topological classification. And you know, that led to the discovery of topological insulators and another, a, a number of other uh, things, okay? And so, so there's been a lot of work understanding the topology of insulators, <clears throat> but you know, um, one can also apply these ideas of topology to metals, okay? And, and there's some precedence to doing this. And of course, in a metal, you don't have an energy gap. You have uh, electronic states filled up to the Fermi energy. Um, and so that defines a Fermi C in momentum states, uh, momentum space, which is the set of momentum states that are occupied. And that's bounded by the Fermi surface. And, um, and, and so this can be associated with topology as well. So for instance, there's old work by Duncan Haldane, which pointed out that um, uh, in, in two dimensions, um, uh, there is a intrinsic contribution to the to the now non-quantized Hall effect, which comes about due to the Berry phase acquired by an electron going around um, the uh, Fermi surface. Okay, and and um, and so uh, now, of course, uh, you know things are more complicated if you have disorder. Then there are other contributions to the Hall effect as well. But um, but there is an intrinsic piece which sort of measures the, uh, you know, the Berry phase um, uh, going around the Fermi surface. In three dimensions, there's a similar thing. So in three dimensions, um, you have a Fermi surface, which is a two dimensional surface, which has a churn number, okay? And in fact, um, uh, uh, in a while semi-metal, um, where the, when you have a Fermi surface that encloses a while point, um, then the Fermi surface, you know, has it's like having a magnetic monopole inside your your Fermi surface, and so that has a non-zero churn number. Okay, and in fact, this is also you know can show up in some sort of response. You know, so Joel Moore and, and collaborators had an idea that this shows up in a term um, in um, in the nonlinear optical response in a you know in a while semi-metal. Okay, and again, and there are caveats associated with this as well: disorder and, and interactions. Um, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, modify this, but nonetheless, one can one can ask whether this topology can be can be probed. Okay. Now, so what I want to talk about is is sort of another version of this, but in, in a way, it's even a kind of simpler uh, version because you know, in a metal, you know, so so uh, so these effects associated with the churn number and the Berry phase, what they are describing is they are describing the way that the block wave functions twist as a function of momentum, say, when you're going around the uh, going around the Fermi surface, okay? But metals exhibit an even simpler kind of topology, um, which is just associated with the shape of the uh, Fermi surface, okay? And so, you know, if you've ever read Ashcroft and Merman, um, then you certainly have seen this picture, which is the picture of the Fermi surface of copper, okay? And so, so you know what happens in copper is that, um, you know, the Fermi surface is a little bit too big for the Broan zone. And so it, it sort of butts up against the uh, boundary and it makes these little necks that, that span the boundary of the Fermi surface, okay? And um, so in fact, this Fermi surface of copper is a topologically non-trivial surface, okay? And so, so actually, so a couple of weeks ago, I was, um, I went to this conference at Berkeley, um, which was, uh, it was a conference about Chern-Simons theory, and it was basically a bunch of mathematicians. And so they were amazed when I told them that the Fermi surface of copper is actually a genus four Riemann surface, okay? Um, so, uh, um, uh, so, 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 the Fermi surface of a metal is a topological object, and this, this doesn't have anything to do with the way the, the, way the block wave functions are, are, are twisting. On the Fermi surface, this is a, this is a separate kind of topology, and so the question that that you know I posed myself, you know, I was spending a lot of time sitting at home, uh, you know, over the uh, pandemic, you know, trying to think of things interesting to think about, and and so 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 I posed myself this question: is is there anything topological and anything that one can can any response that probes this kind of topology? Okay, um, and now, now you know, of course, <clears throat> this, you know, the shape of the Fermi surface of copper has been known for you know since the 1960s, right? You know, and there there are experiments one can do to to detail map out the the shape of the Fermi surface by measuring the quantum oscillations, 
Okay. Um, but the question is, is, is there something like the, um, you know, like measuring the churn number with the quantized Hall conductance? You know, is there some integer that one can measure? Okay. So, um, you know, of course, you know, this is, you know, physics has been known for a long time. And so my first reaction to this is, of course, not. There's no, you know, there, there, you know this, this would have been discovered long ago if, if, if it was the case. But, but as I thought about it more, um, I had an epiphany, which is there actually is an example of this where I know the Fermi surface topology can be measured. Okay. And this um, example is uh, what happens in one dimension. So, uh, and so this is a clue. So in one dimension, um, uh, uh, there is a quantized conductance, which is the Landauer conductance. So if you have a um, ballistic one-dimensional conductor, um, then, uh, um, then it, it, it exhibits a quantized conductance. And so let me just sort of review for you, um, uh, you know, what the argument uh, behind this is. And so, um, uh, so um, in one dimension, you know, you have, you have, you know, you just a one dimensional free electron uh, band structure filled up to the Fermi energy. And so the idea that goes back to Landauer is that if you measure the conductance of this one dimensional wire between two electrical contacts, then, um, uh, then basically the, um, the electrons uh, in the wire are going to be populated according to the reservoir that they came out of. Okay, and so the so the electrons which are moving to the right, um, which have a positive group velocity, they came out of the left contact, so they're filled up to um, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a, a chemical potential determined by the voltage V, whereas the left moving electrons um, are filled up to the chemical potential of the other reservoir. And so um, so. Uh, uh, so then it's a simple matter to, you know, given this uh, situation to ask what the current is flowing, all you have to do is just add up the current carried by every electron, um, you know, uh, every occupied electronic state. And um, so you do an energy, an, an integral between, you know, the two uh, Fermi points and, um, you know, of the, of the charge times the velocity, that's the current. And the magic is that the velocity is, of course, the group velocity, which is the slope, dE dK. And so what you're integrating is a total derivative. And so, um, so the, the, the total current turns into E squared over H times the voltage, okay? And so this is the Landauer uh, 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 formula, okay? And, um, and so you get this uh, you know, quantized um, uh, uh, conductance. Now, now, this is actually exactly the same argument that you would give to explain the quantization of the conductance in the integer quantum Hall effect due to edge states. So this is the sort of landauer Boudicca, you know, argument for the quantization of the integer quantum Hall effect. Um, so, so the difference here is that it's, it's, it's actually not quite as good, okay? Because, you know, what happens in the integer quantum Hall effect is that the left moving electrons and the right moving electrons are spatially separated from one another, okay? And so that means that if you're an electron, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're a right moving electron, there's no opportunity to turn around, okay? And so that makes the quantization and the integer quantum Hall effect perfect, okay? And it's exactly this um, argument. Now, in this case, um, it's not as good because um, uh, in the one dimensional wire, the left movers and the right movers are actually right on, on top of each other. Um, and so, uh, so this makes the effect less robust because, because if you have, um, you know, um, some impurity, some, some, something that electrons can scatter off of, then an electron can turn around in, in the middle. And so then this argument breaks down. Of course, one can generalize this argument, Landauer's argument, to include the fact that electrons can turn around. And so then um, it'll become, it'll depend on the transmission, the wave transmission probability for an electron incident for one from one side to get to the other side, okay? But, but if there's scattering, then the quantization breaks down, okay? But provided we accept that we have ballistic transport with no backscattering and ideal reflectionless contacts, then we have a quantized response, okay? And so you can ask yourself, so if you have a quantized response, you're measuring an integer, so that, that must be some topological thing. What's it probing the topology of, okay? 
Now, in the integer quantum Hall effect, it's probing the topo it's pro probing the churn number basically of this two dimensional, uh, uh, you know, uh, electrical insulator, right? Um, but you know, in this one dimensional wire, we don't have a churn number. Okay, there's no there's no topological um, there's no there's no churn number there's no two dimensional interior between the edge states. Okay, so what we're really doing is we're probing a topological property of the one dimensional Fermi C. Okay, and it it is topological because it doesn't depend on the details. I can change it. Okay, so I can you know uh, change the details of exactly what the um, uh, Fermi C you know looks like, um, and 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 you know since it's a total derivative, it doesn't change. I can keep changing it uh, until the Fermi C splits into two pieces. Okay, and and once that happens, then um, uh, then I get a factor of two. Okay, and so so what this um, uh, Landauer ballistic Landauer conductance is probing is it is probing basically um, the number of disconnected components of the Fermi C. Okay, and that is a topological property of the Fermi C. Okay, it's kind of a trivial topological property, but it's a topological property of the of 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 the Fermi C. Okay, and um, uh, and so that's you know so that's what the Landauer conduct is now. So you know I made this point that you know this isn't as good as the uh, as the integer quantum Hall effect because it because it requires that we have in a sense a perfect a perfect you know a ballistic transport, but that doesn't mean that you can't see it in an experiment. Okay, and in fact there are classic experiments. Uh, where um, where this quantized Landauer uh, conductance has been observed, and this goes back to the 1980s. And you know, Carlo Bainacker was, of course, one of the first people who really understood why why this worked. Um, and so, um, uh, um, uh, so so this can be observed in a quantum in a quantum point contact where you see steps um, in uh, lithographically patterned quantum wires. Carbon nanotubes, semiconductor nanowires. Um, uh, so this is something. If you get, if you have samples which are good enough, then uh, then you can see this quantization. Okay, so it has to be good, but it doesn't have to be completely perfect. Okay, so there's some hope that maybe one can um, one can 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 um, can uh, see this. Now, so um, uh, so 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 I started thinking, you know, so. Uh, so in one dimension, there is a, a a way of topologically probing the topology of the one dimensional Fermi C. Okay, so so the question now is is can we step this up to higher dimensions? Okay, um, and uh, so what I have uh, uh, figured out how to do is to step it up to two dimensions. Okay, and so what I want to um, uh, sort of uh, propose is a kind of generalization. Of this Landauer response. So in in one dimension, what we're basically doing is we have we split our one dimensional wire into two regions, okay, and we apply voltages to those two regions and measure the current that flows, okay. And so what I want to do is in two dimensions, I want to divide the plane into three regions, okay. And then what I can do is define a kind of nonlinear response. Um, uh, where I apply voltages to two of the regions and I measure the current that flows in the third region. Okay, and um, what I'm going to uh, 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 try to convince you of is that um, there is a quantized response that occurs. Um, so it, you know, I'm, so I'm, I have to be applying a frequency dependent um, uh, uh, a voltage, and so there's some powers of the frequency here. With a response which depends on, you know, uh, e cubed over h squared, um, times an integer, where this integer is the Euler characteristic of the Fermi C. Okay, and so this is what I'm going to um, uh, 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 try to uh, convince you of. Okay, and um, so um, uh, so what I've managed to I think establish is at least in a calculation. I can establish that uh, that this is this generalization, you know, applies in 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 two dimensions. Okay, um, going up to higher dimensions, it turns out it's more complicated. 
Okay, and um, so I'm going to focus here on uh, on 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 what happens in um, in two dimensions. Okay, so um, uh, so so I need to tell you what this Euler characteristic is. So the Euler characteristic is a way of topologically classifying the Fermi C. So let me tell you what the Euler characteristic is. Um, so this is something that one one learns about in, in, in topology class. Um, and so the Euler characteristic is a, is a mathematical index that characterizes any sort of um, region, okay? Um, and um, one way that one can uh, uh, characterize it is by introducing what are called the Betty numbers. And what the Betty numbers are, are they're basically, they count um, the number of independent uh, L dimensional cycles that that you can draw. So B zero, the zeroth Betty number, counts the number of topo topologically independent points. And every point within a given connected region is topologically connected. So B zero just counts the number of um, of, of of disconnected segments of your of your of your region. Okay. Um, uh, B one counts the number of loops that you can draw that are topologically distinct. Okay, and so um, and so what the Euler characteristic is is it's the alternating sum of the of the Betty numbers. Okay, and so um, so just as a as an example, so so in one dimension, um, uh, all you have is B zero basically, and so the Euler characteristic is, is just the number of independent components of the Fermi C, and that's that's what the Landauer formula measures. Okay, um, so in two dimensions, so I drew a sort of a hypothetical Fermi surface here. So the yellow is where the electrons are. Um, and um, so one can, uh, one can uh, you know, one can evaluate the Betty numbers. So there's one connected region. Okay, and so B0 is equal to one. And then um, there are two different kinds of uh, non-contractible loops that I can draw. I can basically have it go around one hole or the other hole, and any other loop is going to be sort of, you know, topologically connected to those. And so the second Betty number is equal to two. Uh, or the, excuse me, the first Betty number is equal to two. The second but Betty number, there are no two-dimensional closed cycles that I can draw. And so, um, so the Euler characteristic of this uh, of this Fermi C is equal to minus one. Okay. Now, um, one thing that uh, uh, is important that I the distinction that I make is is that one can one can one can talk about the the topology of the Fermi C, or one can talk about the Fermi topology of the Fermi surface, the boundary of the Fermi C. So so of course the the Fermi surface of this you know uh, in this two dimensional example is just th three loops, okay, and it's not too hard to see that the Euler characteristic of a circle is equal to zero. So the Euler characteristic of the Fermi surface is equal to zero, okay? And so, um, so uh, the, 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 the Euler characteristic of the Fermi C has a little bit more information in it than the Euler characteristic of the Fermi surface. So in general, um, so, so, um, but, uh, uh, but they're related to each other. So, um, uh, so in one dimension, I, as I said, the Euler characteristic just measures the number of components of the Fermi C. So in two dimensions, um, the, 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 the Euler characteristic of the Fermi surface is related to the, excuse me, the Euler characteristic of the Fermi C is related to the Fermi surfaces, but what it basically counts is it counts the difference between the number of electron-like Fermi surfaces and the number of hole-like Fermi surfaces. So in this case, you know, there's one electron-like Fermi surface on the outside, and there are two hole-like Fermi surfaces. And so the difference of those is, is, is minus one. Okay, and so it's not too hard to read off what the Euler characteristic of a Fermi, of a two-dimensional Fermi surface is, is just, uh, of a two-dimensional Fermi C is, it's just the difference between the number of electron-like and hole-like uh, Fermi surfaces. You know, if you wrote it down in three dimensions, then, um, then, uh, then the Euler characteristic of the Fermi surface, it depends on the, on the genus of the, uh, of the Fermi surfaces, okay? And, um, and in general, there's a relationship between the Euler characteristic of the Fermi surface and the Euler characteristic of the Fermi C. In even dimensions, the Fermi surface is always equal to zero, whereas in odd dimensions, they're just related by a factor of two, okay? And so, uh, 
So in two dimensions in particular, the, uh, the chi f uh, has more information in it than the, uh, than the boundary. Okay, so, um, uh, so this is what the Euler characteristic is. And, and so I wanna argue that in two dimensions, um, uh, have some, some probe of, of that property of a Fermi, of a Fermi C. Okay, now it turns out there's actually another way you can think about um, this uh, Euler characteristic, um, which is useful, okay? Um, um, uh, and that is to think about it in terms of the critical points of the, um, of the, of the band structure. And by, by critical points, I mean the energy as a function of K can have maxima, minima, and saddle points, okay? And it's pretty clear that in order for the topology of the Fermi, you know, as you, if you imagine changing the Fermi surface, uh, changing the Fermi energy, um, the topology of the Fermi surface can only change if one of these critical points passes through the, through the Fermi energy, okay? And so, um, and this is the content of, um, of uh, what's called Morse theory, which is another, you know, sort of, um, you know, area in mathematics that relates, um, relates to topology, which, which um, basically tells you that if you have a Morse function, which is a function defined on your region, and the energy as a function of K is a natural Morse function, then one can understand the topology of the region by, by just um, uh, counting the, uh, counting the critical points. So basically you count the, uh, the critical points within the Fermi C with a plus or minus sign, depending on the, um, uh, the number of downward directions. So in two dimensions, a minimum uh, has zero downward directions. A saddle point has one downward direction. So it gets a minus sign. A maximum has two downward directions. So it gets a plus sign. Okay, and so, um, so there's a theorem um, that says that the Euler characteristic is related to the sum over all the critical points weighted by this plus or minus sign, which counts the number of downward directions. Okay, and so and and it makes sense that that it should there should be something like this because um, you know the only way that this topology can change and you know so it changes um, at a transition where a critical point passes through the, the Fermi energy. And of course, these critical points, these transitions. Um, are also something that have been well known for you know many decades. They're they're named after an old guy. Um, they're called Lifshitz transitions. Where um, so for ex for example, if you have a saddle point, then if your Fermi energy is a little bit below the saddle point, then um, then the Fermi C splits is split into two pieces that don't connect. Okay, and if you increase the Fermi energy above the saddle point, then those two pieces get connected to each other. And so there's a change in the topology, the Euler characteristic changes, and, and it changes precisely according to the index of the critical point that, um, that passed through the Fermi surface. Okay, so it makes sense that, uh, that uh, one should be able to characterize the Fermi surface topology in terms of these, um, in terms of these critical points. Okay, um, Charlie, sorry. yes. Please. Uh, a quick question. So I noticed that you uh, omitted one prominent dimensionality, namely zero. Does this uh, does this reasoning apply to zero dimensional systems? And uh, because because also there the Euler characteristic is defined and critical points and everything seem to exist. Um. To be honest, I haven't thought about that. So, so, um, so, so, so there, the Euler characteristic is just the number of electron number of electrons. Is that is that? Um... Yeah, I, I think so. Yes. Uh, uh, so, so it's still defined. So it, it's probably meaning something. It probably means something simple, but it's still yeah, still yeah, peculiar. yeah, All right. yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'm not sure. I, you know, um, uh, uh. Somehow, I imagine that that case was too trivial, but 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 maybe there's something to be said there. I'm, I I had to think about that. Interesting, interesting thought. Yeah. Okay. So now, what I want to try to convince you of is that uh, this shows up in some kind of response. Okay. And um, the way that I want to um, uh, convince you of that is by coming up with some uh, way of thinking about this 
based on a kind of a thought experiment. And so, so in order to motivate that, I want to um, uh, sort of warm up with the corresponding thought experiment uh, in, um, in one dimension, okay? And so this thought experiment is inspired by Laughlin's thought experiment for explaining the quantization of the integer quantum Hall effect, okay? And it's basically a variant on, on um, Laughlin's argument. Okay, and so um, so what I want to imagine now is that I have a one dimension, an infinite one dimensional uh, 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 wire. Okay, um, and um, I divide it into two left and a right region. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a voltage pulse to the, you know the right region. Okay, and so that means there's going to be an electric temporarily. There's going to be an electric field on the boundary here. OK, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to choose this voltage pulse to have an integrated area, which is H over E. OK, and so so um, so this is just like Laughlin's argument. If you imagine that this this one dimensional wire was then closed in a ring, then this would be exactly what happened. What would happen if you inserted a quantum of magnetic flux into the ring? Okay, so, so this is how it's, it's related to uh, Laughlin's argument. And so you know what happens if, if, if you do that, okay? So what happens is that because there's an electric field here, um, you know, the electrons uh, are gonna get a kick and some charge is gonna go into the, you know, some electrons are gonna go off to the right and, 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 and not to the left, okay? Um, and so one way of thinking about that is that the, the electric field is going to um, is going to give an impulse to the electrons, so it's going to transfer momentum to the electrons. So if you think back to you know freshman physics, you know the 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 the, the change in the momentum is the integral of the force times the time, and and um, uh, and and what that tells you is that the change of the momentum is going to be for, for an H over E pulse is going to be precisely two kf. Okay, so it's like one electron gets transferred from, from the left moving side of the Fermi surface to the right moving side of the Fermi surface. Okay, um, and, and so when that happens, then what you know is that at the end of the day, this, you know, everything is the same, except you have one extra electron on the, on the right side and one fewer electron on, on the left side. This extra electron is gonna go off to the right. It's gonna go into the right lead and this, hole is going to go off into the left lead, okay? And so at the end of the day, exactly one electron is going to be collected in the right and one, and, 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 you know, uh, you know, um, and, and one hole will be collected in the left, okay? Now, um, uh, another way you can think about this, which is again, related to the, uh, to the quantum Hall effect, is that this is a manifestation of the chiral anomaly. Okay, and so what the chiral anomaly says is that if you think about the electrons which are moving to the right, they're, they're not really independent of the electrons that are moving to the left. Okay, the right moving and the left moving electrons are not independently conserved. And so an, electri an electric field will, will cause a, a flow of electrons from the right movers to the left movers. And the reason that that happens is because the right movers and the left movers are connected to each other. Okay, and they're connected to each other precisely at the critical points in the um, in the uh, electronic band structure. Okay, and so another way you can think about this, which is useful, <clears throat> is that um, you know, so when I apply the uh, this 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 um, this H over E voltage pulse, I'm actually accelerating every electron, you know, under the Fermi surface, and and the momentum of every electron moves over by exactly one space. Okay, so every electron moves over by one space. And so at the end of the day, there's one fewer electron on this side and one extra electron on this side. Okay, but now what I can do is I can think, you see, the reason that they're not, that the right moving left moving electrons aren't conserved is because if I think, if I look at the critical point, then at every critical point, exactly one electron changes direction. Okay, and that's where the chiral anomaly happens, right? That's where the 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 the, the violation of the conservation of the uh, you know uh, right and left movers happens happens precisely because one electron changes its mind 
um, at every critical point. Okay, and so if you look at this picture here, then then you can sort of see that what happens is well, there there, there are actually three critical points in this picture, and so one electron goes from being a left mover to a right mover here. And then there's an electron which goes from being a, uh, a right mover to a left mover. And here's an electron that goes from being a left mover to a right mover. So at the end of the day, there is one minus one plus one electrons that change their direction. Okay. And, um, and, and that's another way of seeing that there's exactly one electron. But now you can see that it's related to the, to the critical points. And so, uh, so that is, you know, makes it directly related to this Morse theory version of the, um, of the Euler characteristic. Okay. Um, and so this is a way of, 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 of thinking about this. So now, so given this, um, what I want to do is I want to step this up to two dimensions. Okay. And so this next argument is going to be the crux of the, of the whole talk. Okay. Um, and uh, so let me try to, uh, to try to explain this to you. Um, so what I want to, and so the simplest version of this that I um, uh, want to try to um, uh, think about is I want to divide my plane into three regions now. Okay. And just for simplicity and thinking about it, what I'm going to assume is that one of the regions, the first region is the, is the entire half plane. And then the other two regions are two quadrants. Okay. And so what I want to imagine now is that I apply a sequence of pulses. Okay. So I'm going to apply a voltage pulse to the first region. Okay. Um, and I, uh, you know, since this first region is the entire half plane, um, uh, we sort of know what happens after that. Okay, because because I since I have you know translational symmetry in the y direction, every every value of ky um, is just like a one dimensional system. Okay, and so it's just like the case that I had before. So for every value of ky, there is going to be after this first pulse, there's going to be one extra electron on the right side of the Fermi C going to the right and one extra hole on the left side of the Fermi C going to the left. Okay, and so, um, so if you look at this hypothetical Fermi surface here, then uh, uh, if, if I ask what's going on on the right side, then I have everywhere where there's in this blue shaded region, for every value of Ky, I have one extra electron. Okay, so now what I wanna do is now I'm going to, after this first pulse has been applied, I'm gonna apply the second pulse, okay? And the second pulse, what it's gonna do is it's gonna give a kick to the electrons and push them like this. And, and, and so what I want to compute is I wanna compute the charge that goes into this third lead, but I wanna I want compute the charge that, that goes into the third lead due to, due to both of the voltage pulses, okay? So, so I need to subtract off the charge that goes into the third lead if I only applied the first pulse or if I only applied the second pulse. So I will only want the, the sort of connected piece, which is the, 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 um, the, the charge that goes um, uh, uh, due to both of them. So now, of course, if you're going to do an experiment on this, this would be a hard subtraction to make. But what um, I will argue is that this is something that one can do in the frequency domain. Okay, so if you if you apply voltage one at frequency omega one and this at omega two, then if you measure at omega one plus omega two, then you sort of automatically um, are, are not you're automatically getting getting the connected part. Okay, so um, so the point is though is that um, after this second pulse. What I need to do is I need to think about what's the effect of the second pulse on the electrons that were accelerated by the first pulse, okay? And so what the second pulse is gonna do is it's gonna, it's gonna provide and give an impulse to those electrons, which is basically gonna move them over by one space. 
And so what I would like to argue is that I can count the amount of charge that's going to go into this lead by counting the number of these electrons that change their direction. Okay, and so which electrons are going to change the direction? So most of the electrons aren't. Most of the electrons are, are not going to, you know, so if, if I have the electrons that are sitting here where my pointer is, those electrons are definitely going to go into the third lead, whether I have the third, whether I apply the second pulse or not. These electrons are definitely not going to go into the third lead, irrespective of whether I apply the pulse. It's only the electrons that are close where the velocity of the electrons is basically going kind of in the X direction that uh, that are that are you know gonna gonna change change their mind okay and so the question of and and you know depending on whether the Fermi surface is concave or convex then you know if you look at the energy you know as a function of ky here it's going to be a a, a upward going parabola okay so it's as if so as a function of KY, you're at a minimum of the energy as a function of K. Whereas if you're here, it's going to be a downward parabola. So you're going to be in a maximum. Okay. And so, um, so what counting the number of electrons that goes into this contact um, then reduces to is counting these critical points on the side of the Fermi surface. Okay. Um, weighted by a plus or minus, depending on whether you're at a convex or a concave, um, uh, a, a concave or a convex um, uh, uh, a critical point on your Fermi surface. Okay, so, so in this example here, and, and importantly, it's only the ones on the right side of the Fermi surface that we need to include because, you know, uh, uh, you know what's happening on the left side, um, you, you know, the only thing that's affected by the first pulse on the left side of the Fermi surface is the stuff that went off to the left. And that's not affected by the second pulse because it's gone. It's gone off to the left side and it's, 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 it's gone away, okay? So, um, so now if you stare at this picture, so, so if you do this counting, there's, you know, you get one minus one plus one minus one minus one, you get minus one, okay? And that's the same as the Euler characteristic of this Fermi, Fermi C. Remember, remember there's two whole like Fermi surfaces and one electron like Fermi surface. And it's not too hard to uh, uh, convince yourself that um, that this really is the Euler characteristic. Okay, um, so you can imagine what would happen if I bowed this out, um, you know, this point of the Fermi surface. So that what would happen is um, uh, basically instead of having three critical points on the side, I'd only have one critical point, and it would be concave. So, so the so this uh, this counting doesn't change, okay? And uh, you know, so when I was at this math conference a couple of weeks ago, I you know was explaining this argument and basically said this is my idea of a proof, which is to just sort of draw all the pictures and and um, and uh, convince myself that uh, that it works. Um, and uh, so I think it does. So um, so in any case, so um, so this is the argument that this pulse construction probes the Euler characteristic of the Fermi C. Okay, and so this is the crux of my talk. So let me just pause here and, and, and uh, ask if anybody has any, uh, any questions about this. So now, now one can try to back, I can back this up with some, some calculations, um, but, uh, but I think this really, you know, sort of gets at the essence of what it's about. I see a question from- So is there a question? Yep. Yeah. Hi. Uh, just a question. If you are dealing not with a closed Fermi surface, but a Fermi surface uh, which is- uh, Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that spans, the, the, spans next, the bro one zone. The, yeah. the next yeah. brilliant zone, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, it, the, the argument stays the same. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So, okay. yeah. So, 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 um, and, you know, when you count the, um, you know, so I gave this argument that the Euler characteristic is related to the difference between the number of electron like and hole like Fermi surfaces. So you, so you're right. You can also have open Fermi surfaces and those those are neither electron like nor hole like. 
and they contribute zero. Okay, mm -hmm. so for instance, if you had a um, quasi one dimensional system, okay, where the Fermi surface is just completely independent of KY. So it's just a straight line that goes across the, so, so if I just had a bunch of one dimensional wires, you know, and, and think about the two dimensional Fermi surface of that, which is two straight lines that go all the way across. So the Euler characteristic of that is zero. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, because, you know, so there's no electron like Fermi surfaces, no hole like Fermi surface. So it's zero minus zero. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Good question. Any, any other, uh, any other questions? I see a question from uh, Audit, please. Uh, hi, Charlie. Thanks a lot for that. Hi. Hi. Uh, so you have two uh, pulses that uh, in the analogy to the Laughlin pump, it's, a, it's an additional synthetic parameter that I would have threaded through a loop. Can I think of the two orthogonal pulses that... Uh, you're using here as something that maps you to a 2D pump and a 4D hull. Yeah, um, yes and no. So there, there, there's an issue here, which um, is, um, uh, so of course, if you're gonna do a pump, then you need to close the, you, you need to close, close the, you know, you need to have this be connected to this around the other side, right? Um, uh, and so you'd have, to, so then you'd have to be on some, you know, genus two surface, right? You'd have to, and, and then there's an issue with whether what we're talking about is adiabatic or not. Okay. So the pump, I think if you want to talk about some quantized pump, you want to talk about an adiabatic, uh, response where you're doing it sort of infinitely slowly. And there, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a issue with that. So, so the, 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 there's an issue with, with the, um, with the kind of the boundary conditions that you choose at, at, at infinity with this. Okay. Which, um, which makes the analogy, which I think you're trying to get to um, a little bit problematic. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, and, and I'll, I'll come back to this frequency to this, um, uh, to this boundary issue later um, when I ask whether it's possible to measure this. There's an, there's an issue associated with that. Yeah, good. I see a question from Baba, please. Yes, hi. Um, so um, um, this may be a little, uh, I'm not sure if this is the right uh, place to ask this question, but I've been wondering um, about your analogy with, uh, in the 1D case, when you have a ballistic quantum wire, and um, you know, um, if if you take this as the boundary of a two-dimensional system, like in the Chern insulator quantum Hall effect, then uh, then you know that's actually the the quantization there is actually uh, uh, probing the Chern number of the two D system. Right. Um, can one make a connection here, for example, between the two D surface of a topological insulator? Um, is the Euler characteristic here related to anything to the bulk of the 3D system? Yeah, I don't, I don't, not that I can think of. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think there's, I, so, so, so I don't know what 3D system you're talking about, right? So I have a, so I have a two-dimensional electron gas that has a two-dimensional Fermi surface. And I don't know what you're saying that's the boundary of. Um, the, so, for example, a topological insulator with a surface that has, say, um, you know, the Dirac cones that can have. Well, no, but but, but this is this uh, you know this um, uh, this Fermi surface isn't protected like that, right? I mean, um, uh, so I could you know this Fermi sur I could shrink this Fermi surface down to zero, and then you know I could I could I could just push up my my uh, conduction band, or I could, you know, lower my um, my Fermi energy, energy yeah. through the through the bottom of the conduction band, and then it goes away, right? Which you know you can't do that in a topological insulator, but um, but but I can do that now. Of course, when the Fermi energy goes through the bottom, I would call that a Lifshitz transition. Yes. So the topology, you know, goes from having the Fermi C being a disk to having it be nothing. Right, but but I, I don't know how to think about that as a 
as as something that is the bound a boundary effect. Okay, it's really there's no it's not the boundary of something, um, the way the surface of a topological insulator is. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. And and there is a there is a, a question, Adi. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, so what what's quantum mechanical here, and what's what's the classical analog? So in the quantum Hall effect, of course, the classical limit is just the classical Hall effect, and uh, you replace the steps by a straight line. Um, well, I think one quantum thing is the fact that you have a Fermi surface. <laughs> that uh, you don't uh, have a Fermi surface if you don't have quantum mechanics. Right, but, uh, but that's the only thing, right? The, I think so. I think it is. Nature, the fermionic nature of the electron. It's Absolutely. Not, uh, well, well, it's not an hour of bone kind of periodicity or, or something that comes right. in. So, so, so this does not depend on the wave function of the block states. Right. So in that, right. so that aspect of, so, so, so that aspect of the, of the quantum mechanics is not present, Nothing. Yeah. which is, you know, like the churn number does depend on that. Right. Right. Um, uh, and so this is different in, in that regard. So it's more classical, but, but yeah. I mean, but, you can't throw quantum mechanics away completely because if you throw quantum mechanics away, then you don't have a Fermi surface. Yeah, it, I don't know it, how to think but, yet. But the emphasis is on the Pauli principle, not on the... Yeah, uh, no, exactly. And so let me tell you, so so the, the, the calculation that I think is the right calculation to, to back this result up is a semi-classical calculation based on the Boltzmann equation. Yeah. Okay, and 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 so um, uh, the Boltzmann equation has this in it. Yes. Okay. It also has the Landauer formula in it, mm -hmm. right? The Landauer conductance yes. is also in the Boltzmann equation. Yes. Yeah. All right, and I see perhaps one last question from uh, Merck, please. Uh, hi, um, I have a question regarding the two-dimensional system. Yes. Okay. So um, I see that we apply two voltage pulses like in orthogonal directions, and then that's how actually we like kind of dissect the Fermi Fermi C or Fermi surface. Right. So is there any other way except for applying two voltage pulses, like one voltage pulse and one additional knob that we, I mean, maybe a magnetic field or um, I mean any other external um, bias, let's say. Let's say like not that I've thought of, not that I've thought of. I mean, I mean, I, I don't want to say that there's nothing else. <laughs> there, there may be okay, things yeah. that I haven't thought of, but um, uh, um, this is the simplest thing that I was able to come up with that um, uh, that 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 probes it. Um, uh, and yeah, so so somehow um, uh, I think what's necessary is something that is sensitive to the, um, uh, you know, to these critical points on the side of the Fermi surface, okay? And so look, I mean, I think there's an interesting question to ask if there are other ways of getting at this, okay? And, you know, we actually, you know, we have some thoughts about, about that, but, 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 um, uh, uh, but there may well be other ways of, 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 um, of probing this. And, um, and I think it, it's desirable to, to think about the question that you're asking Precisely for the reason that that the proposal that I'm giving here is not perfect, as we will see. Okay, so there are there there are going to be issues associated with it, which um, which uh, you know complicate things. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Vladimir. Oh yeah, uh, maybe I uh, uh, missed that. When you apply the first pulse, don't you get a large uh, current flowing from one to three region? Yeah, exactly. You do, but but yeah. I want to subtract that off. Right. So, so, so the, the, the Q3 that I want to define is so I, so I imagine doing three experiments. I apply a pulse, a pulse just to the, to, to V1 and measure Q3. I pull, apply a pulse just to V2 and measure Q3. And both of those are going to result in big charge, you know, uh, uh, you know, charges that go into the third lead. 
But, but then I want to do this one followed by this one. Okay. And I claim that it's not going to be exactly the same as the sum of the of the um of the of the first two. So let, let's say you would have just uh connection no connection between one and two, but you would first inject it from uh one to two and then apply minus voltage pulse between three and two. Would you get charge stacked in three or not? Let, 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 can you say that again? I wasn't I wasn't with you. So I, I apply uh, I apply a voltage between one so and let, let, let's say let's say one and two are not connected. You inject from one to three directly, and then you extract from three into two. So wait, what voltages am I applying when we're doing that? I, I, I'm, between between one and three. So you, you you don't have direct connection between one and two. So you you cross why, out. Wait, why don't I have direct? I mean, there, there's no there's no. I'm not cutting here. This is. But, I'm, but do you do you need do you need electrons to get into region two in this analysis or? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, 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 so after the first pulse, there's a whole, uh, you know, uh, front of electrons that are propagating to the but, uh, but, uh, to the right. But let, let let's say you don't have connection between one and two; they can only go to three. You first inject. So wait, one. so you mean you mean I'm cutting this piece out? Yes. No, but I don't want to do that because I'm I want to probe the property of the of the entire plane. I don't want to I don't want to I don't want I don't want to use scissors to cut this out. So the the experiments that I'm describing, there are three experiments. I apply just a voltage pulse to this side, but everything is connected. And I measure the charge that goes into three, and then I, I and then in a separate experiment, I apply a voltage pulse to, to 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 this side. Everything's connected, and I measure the charge that goes into three. Okay, so you know, and there will be big charges because there's going to be you know electrons that go across here in the first experiment. There are going to be electrons that go across here in the second experiment. But then what I want to do is I want to do this one followed by this one. And naively, you'd say, well, that should just be the sum of the first experiment plus the second experiment. But there will be some electrons that were affected by both pulses. And those are the and, and, and it's the contribution of those that will contribute to this disconnected piece that I want. And um, and 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 uh, of course, I don't really want to do this subtraction. The way to do that is to do this in the frequency domain. Okay, where I apply this, where if I apply this at a frequency omega and this at a frequency omega omega one and omega two, then um, uh, you know if if I measure at omega one, then I'll I'll get the result of the first experiment. If I measure the, the, the at omega two, I'll get the result of the second experiment. If I measure at omega one plus omega two, then I get the disconnected piece. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, so um, so maybe uh, so, so let me just describe to you a little bit how I, you know, what calculation one can do in order to uh, in order to you know put this on a little bit more solid ground. And as I told Adi, the, the I think the right calculation to do is to do a semi-classical um, uh, 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 theory. Okay, so um, so in this so so um, so in this case, we're characterizing the system by a semi-classical distribution function for the um, electrons. And, um, you know, since I am legislating that, um, that uh, it's ballistic, then, um, uh, then the, you know, the time evolution of this is going to be described by the collisionless Boltzmann equation. Okay. And, um, uh, and so it's a fairly straightforward matter to in introduce the electric field that occurs on the boundaries of region of the regions when I apply the voltage pulses. It's, it's, it's straightforward to introduce that into the um, Boltzmann equation and then compute order by order in the electric field what the, um, what the uh, distribution function is after the, um, after the pulses. So for instance, after the first pulse, then you know the first pulse gives a kick to the um, to the electrons, and then that propagates according. You know you can solve the Boltzmann equation and see how that propagates at you know at a velocity depending by the on the Fermi surface. So you know what the distribution function is after the first pulse, and then that then feeds into the distribution function after the second pulse, 
Okay. And then um, after the second pulse, what we want to do is we want to compute the charge that goes into the third lead, which is just, you know, integrating. And, and so this is a fairly straightforward calculation that you can write down. And, and, and basically the integrals that you end up having to do are just integrating over delta functions. So they're not too hard to, um, not too hard to, uh, to, to do. Okay. And so if you do that calculation, um, uh, with one slight um, uh, subtlety, which is, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I gave this argument with this perfectly straight uh, line here. Um, uh, actually, what I need to assume is that is that the angle here, instead of being exactly 180 degrees, is um, at least epsilon less than 180 degrees. Okay, it turns out there's a difference between whether the angle is less than 180 degrees or the angle is bigger than 180 degrees. Okay, and um, so uh, um, and 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 basically the origin of that difference is you know so so the electrons in the Boltzmann equation they're basically traveling on straight lines, and the difference between having the angle bigger than 180 degrees and less than 180 degrees is that when the angle is bigger than 180 degrees, then there are straight lines that both begin and end in the same region. Okay, and that changes that changes things. Okay, but but if we assume that the angles are less, okay, then um, uh, you know uh, what you end up with is basically when you do the integrals is basically an expression like this. And what this expression is is it it captures exactly the um, the picture that I drew that counted these uh, critical points. Okay, and so um, so it it so this side this sort of localizes you on the uh, right side of the Fermi surface. And then this um, uh, picks out the critical points where, um, where the, uh, you know, where the, uh, where the electrons ch change direction in the Y direction. Okay. And, um, and so once you have this expression, then there's some more manipulation that one can do to turn it into um, something that only depends on the bulk 2D critical points. So I can, I can, I can also write this in terms of something that picks out the, the critical points in the two-dimensional band structure, the maxima and minima, and, and relates to the sort of Morse theory formula for the two-dimensional um, Euler characteristic. Okay, and so, um, so, so this is, uh, you know, uh, one uh, uh, sort of, you know, solid calculation that one could do. And so once you've done this, then, um, then this calculation can be generalized um, uh, in two ways. Um, one is that um, uh, one can uh, generalize it to having arbitrary angles between these uh, regions. Okay. Again, with the with the with the caveat that um, uh, things are different if, if if one of the angles is bigger than 180 degrees. Okay. So the answer is different in in in, in that case. Um, but if the angles are less than 180 degrees, then it it, it is insensitive to what the angles are. Okay, um, so uh, uh, so so it, it you know irrespective of what the angles are, it picks out the uh, Euler characteristic. The other um, thing that one can do is instead of working in the time domain where we have these pulses, we can work in the frequency domain, where you uh, you know you run you know v one at at frequency omega one and run v two at frequency omega two, and um, you know. Uh, it, uh, and, and so basically that recovers this, um, uh, this uh, uh, formula for the charge that flows into region three, okay? And it sort of makes sense that it should be, you know, the pulse argument suggests that it should be, you know, uh, V of omega divided by omega. So that, that you know, that's like, that Fourier transforms to a, to, to kind of a step-like function. Um, and, um, uh, and so this is the, um, the frequency dependent nonlinear conductance that uh, that follows uh, from this. Okay, so this is one um, a type of calculation that uh, that 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 one can do. Okay, now um, so so another kind of calculation that one can do is to do what you would do. Um, you know, you know the first thing maybe you think of when you're doing the you know if you want to calculate do the Landauer formula you want to you know do the Kubo formula for the electrical conductance. So you can do the 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 generalization of linear response quantum linear response theory. 
Um, and for back of, lack of a better name, we can call it quantum nonlinear response theory. And so there, um, you know, uh, so one can, you know, so what we're doing is we're just applying potentials. And so let me do it in the frequency domain now, apply frequency dependent potentials to my two, re to, to my two regions, okay? And then just in perturbation theory in these, in these applied potentials, uh, compute the charge that that uh, goes into the third region. Okay, and so this is um, you know exactly the same um, uh, type of calculation that would go into computing the nonlinear response. You know, like nonlinear optical response at finite frequency. It's the same same kind of calculation, um, and so uh, so you end up with the same kind of formulas that you get in. Uh, you know, uh, nonlinear response. So there's going to be two energy denominators and three matrix elements. And so what one's basically doing is um, calculating a kind of a three-legged um, bubble diagram, okay? Um, and so what I've been able to uh, uh, show is that provided I... Um, I, I Kind of make a um, uh, slowly varying semi-classical approximation where the basically the boundaries of my regions, you know, where I have the electric fields, um, there the potential is varying slowly on the scale of the Fermi wavelength. Okay, so if I allow myself to make this um, this uh, uh, slowly varying approximation, then basically what I am end up doing is I'm calculating this, this three-legged bubble diagram um, as a function of Q and omega for small Q and omega, okay? And um, the kind of interesting thing is, is that this small and Q and omega limit of this bubble diagram kind of has a, has a topological piece in it that knows about the Euler characteristic of the Fermi surface, of the, of the, of the Fermi C, okay? And in fact, um, so what um, I, I can show by, by, by doing this is that what you get from this nonlinear response calculation is exactly what you get from the Boltzmann calculation. And, you know, maybe it's not a surprise that that, that should be the answer because there's no scattering. And so basically Boltzmann is right. Okay, and so so this non this this perturbation theory, quantum perturbation theory calculation, um, sort of has to be captured correctly by the Boltzmann uh, equation. So, um, but nonetheless, um, uh, it's 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 somewhat instructive to see how that um, how that emerges, and and what that teaches us is that there's sort of a topological piece of this of this um, nonlinear response bubble. Okay, which um, which I think is something that hasn't really been uh, recognized completely. Okay, so that's uh, another uh, set of calculations that I've uh, that I've done. Okay, now so um, so so uh, so I have this result. Okay, and um, so this result I think is exact um, uh, for non-interacting electrons defined on the in infinite two-dimensional plane, okay? And so the question that maybe is interesting to ask is whether it's conceivable that this is something that can be measured, okay? So, so um, uh, and, and there are issues uh, associated with this. First of all, is that, is that you know, uh, you don't generally have non-interacting electrons and you don't generally have an infinite plane, okay? And so, um, uh, so what's the role of electrical contacts and what's the role of electron-electron interactions, okay? And so these actually both complicate the matter. Um, and, uh, and so let me try to explain to you what, um, uh, what these uh, complications um, are, okay? And so first, let me talk about the electrical contacts. So let me sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, imagine what kind of experiment maybe one could uh, think about doing. So, so what I want to imagine. So, so what I need to do is I need to set it up so I have these 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 voltage pulses in a two dimensional electron gas. So I want to have a big, a big two dimensional uh, electron gas. So maybe it's graphene or maybe it's some other uh, nice clean uh, two dimensional. Uh, electron gas, and then um, what I want to do is I want to have my electric field, you know, kind of in these 
boundary region. So what, what I'm going to do is I want to imagine putting, uh, you know, metal contact over the top um, that define these three um, regions. Okay, and um, uh, and 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 you know, of course, I I, I want the electrons to you know, the, I don't want them to immediately go into the metal. So the, so here's the issue. Okay, which is um, so there's a there's a there's a kind of a mean free path um, that the electrons, which is which defines how far an electron travels in the two deg until it until it tunnels into the metal. Okay, and that you know that depends on how big the tunnel barrier is between the um, between the two dimensional electron gas and the metal contact. Okay, and so um, so so here's the issue. Which is, let's imagine I, I do this pulse construction where I apply a pulse and then I apply a second pulse and I want to ask what's the current that flows into the third region. So, so, um, so, uh, so there are two, two issues. First of all, I have, to, I have to wait long enough so that any electrons that went into the third region of the two deg actually make it into the contact. Okay, so I have to wait. So I have to wait longer than this dwell time. Um, for the third contact. But the bigger issue is that, you know, what would happen if I applied the first pulse and then I waited, you know, went and got a cup of coffee and, you know, waited and then came back, you know, you know, an hour later and applied the second pulse. Then, you know, obviously um, everything that was excited by the first pulse will have gone off into the leads and will have disappeared. And the first pulse will have been completely forgotten. Okay, so, so nothing. Well, there won't be anything. Okay, so it's essential that the second pulse be applied while the electrons are still in the two deck. Okay, and so that is a um, pose. You know, uh, you know, puts a bound. So if we if we think about this in the frequency domain now, then what this means is that you can't do it at too low a frequency. Okay, and so in this sense, so this is an issue which is, which is different from the Landauer formula. So the Landauer formula, of course, works. In fact, it's even better. It's best in the DC limit. Okay, and so we don't have the luxury for this effect of going to the DC limit. Okay, because we're bounded by this, um, by this, by this, you know, time scale, which is this dwell time. Okay, so we need to work at frequencies which are uh, you know, large compared to one over this dwell time. Okay, so that's one, uh, you know, that's an issue um, um, that, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, whether this completely sinks, uh, whether this is possible to measure or not, I'm not sure. Okay, so, um, so this is something that, that maybe, I think maybe it will require some experimental uh, ingenuity. Now, there's another issue, though, which is to think about the role of electron, electron interactions. And so this is actually something that, that um, uh, you can also think about uh, in one dimension. Okay, um, so uh, so what happens if you have uh, short range electron electron uh, interactions? So in one dimension, there's actually an old story uh, that uh, that goes with this. Um, uh, and um, so in one dimension, if you have elect you know short range electron electron interactions, then you have a Luttinger liquid. Okay, and um, you know thirty years ago, um, I wrote a paper with Matthew Fisher. Um, where we pointed out that in a Luttinger liquid, the uh, the Luttinger parameter um, uh, modifies the uh, the Landauer conductance. Okay, and so the calculation that we did um, was exactly this linear response Kubo formula uh, calculation. Okay, now um, uh, shortly after we wrote that paper, there were a whole series of papers um, explaining why we were wrong, okay? And the issue there is um, there's sort of an order of limits uh, problem with the uh, frequency compared with this uh, length, you know, with, the, with this dwell time, how long it takes the electrons to disappear uh, into the leads, okay? And so the calculation that, 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 that we did was at finite frequency, in the limit that L goes to infinity. So we have an infinite Luttinger liquid computed at finite frequency, okay? And so then um, the Luttinger parameter screws up the quantization 
of the Landauer conductance. Okay. Whereas um, if you have a finite length wire with coupled to leads, okay, and so you take the frequency to zero limit for finite L, then the Landauer conductance actually goes back to being perfectly quantized. So basically you're probing the fact that the electrons are Fermi liquids in the leads, the, the, the Fermi leads are, that the leads are a Fermi liquid. Okay. Um, and so, uh, so the Landauer formula is, is, is better at zero frequency. Okay. than it is at finite frequency. Now, the problem we have uh, for, for my generalization is that we don't have the luxury of going to zero frequency because of the problem I told you before. Okay. So in fact, um, at finite frequency, the short range interactions uh, do modify the conductance kind of in the same way that the Luttinger parameter modifies the conductance in 1D. And so, um, so if you were to do, um, you know, this, this, you know, perturbation theory in the interactions, um, uh, you know, where the Luttinger parameter would show up, it, was, it would show up precisely in a kind of RPA type correction to the, uh, to the, to the conductance. And so similar corrections will occur in this, um, in this, two-dimensional uh, conductance and they give rise. So, so the Fermi liquid parameters, which, you know, characterize the short range electron-electron uh, 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 -electron interactions will then um, uh, modify, uh, they'll, they'll screw up this uh, conductance. Okay. And so you get a correction, which is basically going to be of order the short range interaction times the density of states. Okay. So, um, so the upshot of this is, is that um, uh, in order to see this quantization, um, uh, uh, you need to work in a system that has weak interactions. Okay, so if you have if you don't have weak interactions, then um, then it's going to be messed up by the uh, electron electron interactions. Now, um, you know maybe there's some hope. Um, uh, uh, graphene could have weak interactions. So if you have um, uh, you know uh, 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 Graphene with a short range Coulomb interaction that's screened, you know, you have, we have these metal contacts, which are going to, you know, form a, a, a ground plane that'll screen the Coulomb interaction. So the Coulomb interaction short range, um, if you get close enough to the Dirac point in graphene, then the density of states is small. So one, ex so, so perhaps one can get into a regime where, um, where the Fermi liquid parameters are um, small. Okay, and so um, and the thing which is uh, uh, interesting, if you compare, um, you know, the electron dope to the hole doped uh, side of um, of the Dirac point in graphene, then um, then the Fermi surfaces are actually different. Okay, uh, on the electron side you have a electron Fermi surface, and on the hole side you have a hole Fermi surface, and the Euler characteristics are different. Okay, and so um, so what this predicts is that as you vary the Fermi energy through the Dirac point, then you get a jump in the um, in this nonlinear conductance. Okay, and so um, so maybe I don't know if there's some hope of doing this. There's, I think I think one has to you know think carefully about whether this is whether this is feasible or not. Um, that's uh, that's a that's a that's a um, a good question. Okay, so that's that's that. Okay, so I, I should probably uh, kind of finish up here. I don't know if I I probably already too late, but um, but let me just uh, say. So I think this idea points to a number of um, further things that we can one can calculate. And 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 so one question is is whether there are other probes of you know. So you know, one sort of epiphany I've had is that there is this fundamental characterization of a metal, which is the Euler characteristic. And that, you know, that's a quantized number that exists. And, um, and, and so, uh, so, so I've come up with some kind of probe that can potentially probe that. One can ask whether there are better ones. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, in one dimension, there are, there are other probes of the sort of, of the number of, you know, the Euler characteristic of a one-dimensional Fermi C. So for instance, the thermal conductance, um, uh, you know, of course, that's related by the Wiedemann Franz law, but but actually, it probes a kind of a, a different property. It, it probes C, the 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 the, the central charge of a conformal field theory, um, and um, so one could ask: so maybe this is 
something that, and, and of course, C is not affected by the, uh, by the short range interactions. Okay, so in a Luttinger liquid, C is still equal to one. So, um, so maybe there's some generalization of this, of course, and you know, there's also, uh, you know, no, uh, you know, frequent, you know, noise that one can measure. If one measures noise correlations. There may be quantized signals in that as well. So I think it, it it's worthwhile to think of whether there are other probes um, of 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 this uh, of this quantized quantity. Another thing that I think is interesting to think about is um, is whether there's some deeper meaning of of this Euler characteristic, and and because it's kind of you know in one dimension. It's, it's, it's deeply connected to the chiral anomaly in one dimension, which, is, which describes the fact that the left movers and the right movers are connected to each other, okay? And they're connected to each other precisely at the critical points of the, of the band structure. So, so in two dimensions, there's kind of a generalization of that because, you know, in two dimensions in a, you know, in a Fermi liquid, you don't have just left movers and right movers. You have movers that are going in all different directions, okay? And those, all those different directions are connected to each other at the two-dimensional critical points at the at the you know minima, maxima, and saddles. Okay. And so there's some kind of maybe some generalization of this kind of anomaly that happens for that. Okay. And so I'm not exactly sure how to think about that, but I think this is this is something that that you know it's, what's the right way of stating that fact um, is a is an interesting thing. Um, uh, I think another uh, direction that one can think about, and, and I suspect this is the case, is that um, so in one dimension, um, you know, this same quantity that counts the number of pieces of the Fermi surface or, or you know, or the, the chiral central charge C um, shows up in a universal characterization of the um, bipartite entanglement. So if I, if I imagine cutting my one dimensional system into two pieces, then there's a universal characterization of the entanglement between those two pieces, which depends on what for free for 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 non-interacting electrons is the is the is 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 the uh, the Euler characteristic of the of the Fermi C. Okay, and so does this is this something that generalizes uh, to uh, to higher dimensions? Okay, so um, so uh, so I think I, I think there's also an issue. Um, which is how to generalize this result, which I think I have solidly established in two dimensions. What's the three-dimensional generalization of that? Now, in the paper that I posted, I sort of blithely um, uh, stated that uh, that um, that one can write down a formula for the three-dimensional um, nonlinear conductance. Okay, and that is something which it's a, the story is actually a little bit more complicated than that. Okay, so that's sort of a, a work in progress. Um, but um, so, so there, there's an interesting question of how that gets generalized. And then, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, are these things, you know, you can have Fermi surfaces in materials that are not Fermi liquids. Okay, and uh, so maybe this provides a, um, a way of characterizing uh, those sorts of systems. So, so maybe that's a, a direction one could go as well. Okay, so um, so this is this is um, uh, all that I have, and I'm happy to stick around um, if people have more questions. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Charlie. All right, uh, I see already uh, the first question, uh, Stefan. Yeah, thank you uh, very much uh, for this nice talk, and also for the very nice work. Um, so I was wondering about this uh, kind of experimental problem in this 2D plane uh, experiment, right? And uh, one thing that somehow sprung out to me is that you are not really looking ever to put in electrons or take out electrons out of the sample overall, right? You're only looking to swoosh around electrons. Uh, well, okay, so there's a question, with, yeah. So, so, so the answer is yes and no. I mean, there are two ways you could go about doing it. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, so um, one thing one could do is one could have capacitively coupled leads. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. And so, so, so then of course you want to, yeah. So, so then all of your frequencies have to be um, high compared to the amount of time it takes the electrons to sort of bounce off the walls. 
right? So there's, there's a, there's well, a, a there's a frequency the scale associated with the size of your two deg, and you have to be, which you have to be higher than higher than that. Um, yeah. Now, um, and of course, you know, um, uh, some of the frequencies have to be higher than that because of this issue that I raised. But you could also imagine that having omega one plus omega two be very small, okay? In which case you're waiting for electrons to tunnel into the last lead, into the third lead. And then you're collecting the electrons in the last lead. So, so they're different. I don't, so I'm not sure if one is better than the other, maybe, maybe doing the capacitively coupled leads is the better, is, is better. Um, I expect they're both hard, <laughs> um, but yeah, but yeah, there are, there are different ways that one could imagine trying to, uh, to get at that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, the capacitively coupled case was more, more natural because you leave the two that kind of less disturbed, right? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so, um, so ex exactly. So that may be the best way to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, audit. Um, so thank you, Charlie, once more for the very nice talk and resolve. Um, so now a similar question to what Stefan asks. Uh, in Topological insulators, I will have something that is related to the index in my system and whatever it is that lives on, on my out, outer world, right? And now I'm trying to con contact another metal that can have a different characteristic, uh, Euler characteristic to it. Uh, do I expect that this will give therefore reflection and destroy the, the quantization? Or, or should I see so, something? So, so let me understand. So, are you imagining that you have a two-dimensional system that has a one region with one Euler characteristic, another region with another Euler characteristic? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So basically, what you want to imagine is that you go through the Lifshitz transition as a function of position. Right. Right. Um, yeah, there, maybe there's something interesting to say about that. I, you know, I, I don't know that it, it could be, um, the question, you know, I mean, um, the question is, is whether, whether it's possible to have something which has a topological signal in it that isn't overwhelmed by everything else. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, uh, so, so, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, that, that, that could be something that's interesting to, to think about. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, thanks. Um, I also have a couple of questions, but I, I'll start with a remark. I, I thought a little bit more about the zero dimensional case. Okay. And the formula works brilliantly and, re uh, and gives the profound uh, result that the total charge of a zero dimensional system is equal to electron charge times the number of occupied levels. And this result is uh, valid adiabatically, non-adiabatically with interactions, it's just valid. Um, anyway, with, with that out of the way, actually, the, the actual questions. Um, so first of all, uh, I find the comparison with the quantum Hall effect quite uh, um, inspiring in that the quantum Hall realizes the same phenomenon, but more robustly by separating the different parts of the Fermi surface. Now, if I were to uh, imagine uh, a modification of say the two dimensional experiment, uh, so that the different parts of the Fermi surface are separated, the 3D version of it would be a, a Fermi arc in a while semi-metal, right? So it has a single, it's, it's a disconnected Fermi surface, which has a single uh, critical uh, uh, point where the curvature vanishes, uh, or sorry, the, where, where the velocity vanishes. Do you think that would work and uh, would be more- uh, So so let me just understand. So, so, so if, so you wanna, um, so in a wild semi-metal, you can take a Fermi surface and split it in half and have half of it on the top and half of it on the bottom. Um, Yeah, I mean, of course, you still have lots of points on the top Fermi surface and lots of points on the, the, the there, there are lots of directions, right? Sure. Um, uh, so it's not, mm. 
Those it's not clear to me what you're going to measure. Um, yes, presumably the same thing, right? I still have this region where I apply voltage, region where I, I apply another voltage and I measure charge. But now, instead of having it connected for my surfaces, I have half of it. Yeah, that's interesting, Anton. Um, um, yeah, I mean, of course, um, the two sides of the Fermi surfaces are connected to each other via the wild points. Um, same, but, same but that's, with yeah. Quantum Hall effect, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, exactly. at least yeah. seems similar. Well, no, except in the quantum Hall effect, there's a gap in the interior. Well, the Whereas, H state the edge state goes to the to the Landau level that connects it to surfaces. Right. Yeah. And oh, the gap. Ah, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah. Yes. Mm, yeah. Uh, but okay. The question is uh, more broadly speaking, uh, if it's possible to imagine a uh, a similar way of protecting this response, uh, like like it happens in one D. Yeah, so that's a. I mean, so the question is: is can you isolate the the Fermi point, isolate the 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 different directions on the Fermi surface spatially? I, yeah, I don't know how to do that. That would be, you know, um, it'd be pretty cool if you could. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, I, I see a question from Adi. Uh, you're muted, you're Adi. Adi. Sorry. Um, one thing uh, that came to mind is this uh, three-legged diagram are uh, um, a major part of what uh, makes Coulomb drag work. So I wonder if you can uh, get anything, uh, uh, any consequence of this when you think of Coulomb drag. And Coulomb drag, usually we think of a disordered system. Right. Uh, but, but Well, let me just start, so let me say, so what frequency and momentum regime are you in for so, that? So usually what happens is that in, in the in the triangle diagram or you know you do it as a circle. Uh, in the tri triangle diagram you have one the incoming frequency is, is close to DC and, and therefore the other two are basically uh, the same up to a minus sign mm -hmm. and, and they are they go from zero to temperature. That's that the way it is. Uh, now, now, you know, we, we can imagine at least the level of imagining experiments uh, where, where you also do acid drag or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, and then the, the, the drag response is just two triangles uh, uh, coupled to one another, one in each of the two layers that. Uh, constitute the drag uh, system. I see. Interesting. Yeah. So, so um, that I think that's that's worth thinking about whether. So the question is, is whether that is able to sort of access the topological piece of that of that of that uh, triangle diagram. Um, exactly. And, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. If I know the answer to that. This is one question. The other, if I, if I can only show. Yeah. Sure. Is it, so you talked about the effect of electron-electron interaction through uh, basically the real part of the self-energy, but not through scattering. So, so uh, you know what effect it would have if if there's an electron-electron scattering time, then we know in the Landauer case uh, it has a profound effect of of the conductor. Um, right. So I think so. What I would argue is that in a Fermi liquid, those are going to be, those are going to tend to be suppressed, right, by right, the phase but suppose, space. But, but suppose that you go to high enough temperature or something. Right, yeah. So then, to... yeah, so then I think there would be, I think that they would probably come in. Um, yeah, so I guess, right, okay. So, so then you're going to say that those don't, those don't, um, those conserve momentum, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, uh, so that's the question. Whether something interesting can come out of that. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing that I've thought about is 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 sort of the effect of the electron-electron interactions, you know, kind of in the low temperature limit where you're really yeah, yeah, in the Fermi yeah. liquid regime. And there, um, 
uh, the Fermi liquid parameters are basically just giving you sort of RPA like um, right. yeah. corrections to the, you know, you know, so they're not, you know, they're not, they are present, but they're sort of, um, uh, you know, it comes through these RPA type corrections. Right. Yeah. 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 But I think you're right at finite temperature when you do have, when you, when you do allow yourself to have scattering, um, you know, uh, then, then there will be other uh, corrections as well. Right. All right. Um, I also have a couple uh, uh, more questions. Sure, um, please. So there's also a question all, on the chat. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a question whether there is a link between this work and the quantum geometric tensor, uh, which is so there's the, the there's the real part of it which is associated with a with a churn number and uh, oh, sorry the imaginary part that's associated with a churn number well, and the real part yeah so i think no because you see this is not about the wave functions of the block states right um you know the so um so the churn number and also i think if i understand correctly what you're saying this quantum geometric tensor those are um properties of the block wave functions you know, defined on the Fermi surface, whereas this is not a property of the block wave functions. It's only a property of the of the the sort of shape of the Fermi surface. Okay, and so so um, so I think the Boltzmann equation would not know about the quantum geometric tensor. Is that does that sound right to you, Anton? I think I so yeah, I, I, yeah. I think so. So um, uh, uh, so so in that sense, this is uh, quite different from that. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted, first of all, I wanted to ask uh, another question uh, about optical response. Sure. So, so of course, uh, now I understand that in a, in a, in a realistic system, uh, optical response would be influenced by disorder, by all the non-adiabatic processes, by interactions, but uh, would perhaps some part of the phenomenon survive and still this, it, like, you would be able to tell whether it's selections or holes. Uh, are you aware of uh, of like uh, of relations to nonlinear optical conductance? Right. I mean, um, the question is whether you can be in the right frequency regime, right? Um, uh, um, So probably it wouldn't be optical, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, right. Uh, I mean, ra radio. Yes. So yeah. Radio. Yeah. Um, uh, so there, you know, so it's like the frequency-dependent conductivity, right? I mean, it's our, and so, so ultimately, you know, this. I, I'm not sure I understand the difference between the between measuring the conductance at finite frequency and 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 this optical. Or radio. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I guess. I guess right. ultimately, it's it's uh, closely related to the question of uh, capacitively coupled leads. Yeah. Exactly. Probably right. The yeah. Same thing. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, perhaps one final question, which which uh, there, there's one formalism that you didn't touch, and that's the scattering matrix formalism. So since everything here happens close to the Fermi surface. Uh, do you know if uh, this is some kind of Taylor expansion of the scattering matrix uh, uh, across energies that would uh, uh, that would contain this information or something alike? When you say scattering matrix, so you're talking about um, an electron which is incident from one lead and then scatters into another lead. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure that there's any signature in 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 that. Um, I, I haven't thought about it completely, but but um, you see, because that depends a lot on the on the you know the the geometry of exactly how the leads are oriented. <laughs> Right, you know, I mean, 
you know, it depends, you know, you have this ballistic transport problem, the electrons go through, they go in a straight line. And then, you know, where do they, where do they hit when they get to the other side? Mm -hmm. Right. Or do they bounce off yeah. of the wall or, you know, and, and so somehow that physics is, 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 seems to me is what's going to dominate the scattering matrix. Yeah, and so the question is whether there's some signature that knows about the topology um, of the well, Fermi rather I'm, a, I'm, I'm once again comparing it with the 1D case where there's a clearly defined limit of a perfect scattering matrix, which, uh, which, which only has transmission eigenvalues one and where the Landauer scattering formula works. Uh, similarly, maybe maybe in higher dimensions. I well, no, but it, but if I imagine some three terminal device, yeah. I don't know what perfect transmission is. Well, uh, no, that of course is not defined. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah. then again, it's also not the scattering matrix which is important, but it's uh, how it depends on the energies because because the response is not zero frequency. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. So so. Uh, it's possible there's something there. I haven't, I, I, you know, I thought about it a little bit um, uh, and I didn't find anything, but, uh, but, but that doesn't mean that somebody else couldn't find something. So that, that could be a good thing, good thing to think about. All right. Uh, I see no further questions. Uh, so once again, thank you very much for, uh, for the fascinating talk. Well, great. And thank you very much, Anton, for, uh, for making this happen. It was, it was a pleasure and it was, it was good to see some of my old friends and, uh, and uh, you know, thank you very much. <laughs>